But that doesn't that doesn't mean you don't have a cross, right? And and that you see that insistence in the gospel accounts, as I said, you know, the insistence that Christ suffered as a man despite having God, but with being God. That's those are both true at the same time. Mm. Mm. I feel like life is all these like little tiny contradictions, but things are true at the same time. That's why I think I like the metaphor, like the use of everything all everywhere all at once, because I think like all things are true at the same time. And it depends on the relationship you're having with things. But also this true is so unattainable. But that idea that we can attain it is keeping us from finding the truth. There's this idea that I could find the truth if I look for it, which I do think is true. But I don't think it's the true that people think they're trying to look for, what Peterson's trying to look for, which is why they never feel like they're really in sync with their joy, because then they don't understand why they haven't found the truth. And they think it's like a, a testament to their intelligence. This is why I say introspection isn't just intelligence. Some of the most intelligent people I know are some of the most just they're making decisions to be less introspective because their intelligence is getting in the way. It's just what happens because your intelligence is connected to your ego and really it's your ego that's getting in the way. There's something in your brain that tells you, I have to know the truth because I'm the one who's smart. Being smart was never the problem, which I think goes back to what Alex was referring to about academia versus the common man. There's something so much more true in the life of a common person than in the life of an academic. That's not to be anti-academia. It's to say that sometimes your ego is so enwrapped in your job and your field of study that sometimes you stop yourself from really seeing the truth. So you're seeking a truth that is unattainable and that within itself is the truth, which is why the journey is the truth. And this idea of like finding this end point, that's the illusion. And letting go of that attachment is kind of the point. So I'm here today speaking with Alex O'Connor, who's flown in from London. I'm in LA. He's known also as cosmic skeptic, and he runs a podcast within reason. Alex was recommended to me by a friend of mine, John Verveke. Was Shout out John Verveke, meaning crisis. Let's go. We love Verveke. We love this. Um, Who said that? Is this a religious jacket? Cam asked. Yeah, it has. I see Mother Mary. I see variations of Mother Mary and Jesus. It looks like a multiple. Yeah, it looks like a pattern of the, I see the angel. Maybe that's the angel Gabriel. I'm not sure which angel that is. But yeah, it is a it looks like a Catholic jacket. Now, Tammy, his wife, we love Tammy. She just not that I agree with Tammy on things, but like I like her as a human, as a consciousness. She recently converted to Catholicism, but Jordan has not. So okay. first of all. OK, first of all, just shout out to already what he's going to say, which is about story, how story tells us so much truth about what it means to be a person, good, bad and ugly girl. Many ideas are misleading and wrong. And so you have to learn how to combine that openness and curiosity with the capacity to separate the wheat from the chaff. Yeah. And that's the utility of skepticism. I mean, it can degenerate into a kind of argumentative nihilism. That's the downside. But properly applied, it, it, uh, it separates the wheat from the chaff, right? And the purpose of that is to keep the wheat. Well, skepticism can only ever be essentially destructive because you're being skeptical of something. Somebody's putting something forward and you're sort of responding to that with skepticism. And so for a lot of people, if, if skepticism is the thing that you do, then you sort yeah. of end up chipping away and ending up with nothing. Whereas skepticism is really supposed to be a tool that you use. It, it is destructive, but in the way that you might sort of um, carve a piece of marble. Yeah, you're, right. You're intending to get yes. a statue out of it. At the yes, end. yes. Well, that's the thing to always keep in mind is yeah. skepticism in the service of something. Exactly. Yeah, it's a right. tool. It's a methodological right. tool. It's well, not a world. And you, you mentioned too, and so I'm interested in your progression in, in your thinking in relationship to that because you mentioned just before we actually went on air, that had you come to see me a couple of years ago, you might have been more inclined to, I, I'm i putting words in your mouth to some degree, so correct me if I'm wrong, to strive for a victory or to make your point, something like that. And you alluded to the fact that your thinking around that has changed to some degree. I suspect that's probably a consequence of experience. So what's changed in part, it might have something to do with becoming a podcaster and speaking yeah. weekly to people. And you, you can't keep up that energy. Uh, or, or you can, but it becomes totally unwatchable. And, and nobody wants to nobody wants to engage in that all the time. I think no. there, are, there are times when it's worth doing. And, and to be clear, you know, I still like to, to disagree and do so essentially unapologetically and bluntly. And mm -hmm. that can still come across as quite rude. Mm -hmm. But I think that the way that I would think about a conversation is that, well, what, what are we about to do here? A debate. Mm -hmm. We're about to debate an issue, mm -hmm. and I'm going to try to win. And and that's 
and not not even I mean maybe there's sort of a, an element of pride in there you want yeah. to win for that sake but also you really think well I want to win because I think I'm right about this and if I don't then you know I must have just not expressed myself properly I, I think I you know I, what I probably meant when I was saying that is that I would have had more of that cap on than now after having so many conversations with so many people and realizing that not only is it more constructive for myself I've learned a lot more you know, yeah. I, and now, now I'm here like, hey, I might, you know, I might learn something today. That would be great. Even if I just learn something about what your worldview is. Um, but also people listening just unanimously say that they prefer it. It's, it's a much... Well, this, the skepticism. So one of the things you learn as a therapist, for example, is that being right is not very helpful, especially when you're trying to help someone, because whether you as the therapist is right has very little to do with the positive outcome for them. Mm-hmm. You mm -hmm. still want to maintain the skepticism. And there, one of the ways of doing that in the manner that's helpful is that, like, if I'm talking to you and you say something I don't understand, that's the right place to be skeptical. Because if I don't understand what you said, well, it might be my ignorance, but it also might be, like, lack of clarity and mm. pointedness on your part. Mm. And so one of the advantages of disagreeing with someone is to point out to them in a positive way where they're lost in the fog. Because if you're sufficiently lost in the fog, you tend to run into sharp objects and that's not very pleasant. So, but the skepticism, and, and this is obviously what you alluded to, I would say as a consequence of learning from the podcast, is the skepticism mm. should be in service of rectifying your ignorance rather than in service of making your point or winning the argument. Problem with that is, okay, I will say, let's pause it here for a second. First, I want to say that that is true. I like that he said being right is not very helpful. I think that's so true. I don't love people trying to save you in a conversation, even from hurting yourself. I feel like there's a level of, you got to learn, bro. If you're not going to learn by observing, you got to learn by doing. But I do think that I like that especially, like being right is not very helpful, which is probably why I'm moving away from debates myself, because I've never wanted to be in the debate space. I just found myself here. And I keep trying to join these panels and I'm like, I don't want to debate you. I'm not trying to like be right. I'm just trying to explore ideas. But that sends a, an alarm bell in people's brains sometimes because they're thinking, well, no, you you wouldn't do it if you didn't think it was right. And I was like, well, most of the world does plenty of things they don't think are that they, they know aren't right. So it's not about right or wrong, but it is about exploring, which is interesting. Second thing I noticed, um, for those in chat who do not like Jordan Peterson's fashion style, I am shook to my core because I literally love it but I'm also like I think it's so like queer chic I think it is so good like he's so comfortable being like feminine but masculine I think I will always appreciate that Jordan Peterson is like so fluid in his dress so shout out to whoever styles Jordan Peterson because Britney loves it but shout out to those who don't because I love that we all like different things but I will say that I'm not I'm not convinced that Jordan isn't still falling prey to the thing that I personally do not like, which is the desire to sort of save someone. He said saving someone from the fog. I don't I don't think that is necessary. I'm not personally interested in saving you. I'm interested in like seeing if you want to use the tools that life gives you, right? But I do wonder if that also is a reflection of his own existence as I do find Jordan Peterson to be like paranoid and weak. But I also, it's weird. He's like so strong, but he's also so weak. And it's kind of interesting. And not that weak in a vulnerable way. Vulnerability is beautiful. But he's like got a weakness of character about him. But I think that's related to his attachment of fear, which I think fear is the root of all evil in a philosophy sense, you know, not a practical sense. Practicality dictates fear as a necessity. But in a philosophy sense, to know the character of the spirit of the human, um, to be one with your nature is to like accept the fear, not to become beholden to it and I think Peterson runs into that problem a lot he's so fearless when it comes to fashion and so fearful when it comes to things that are outside of his bubble winning a bloody argument is that the victory can seduce you into thinking that you were correct and you're never sufficiently correct right yes and so I don't like debates fundamentally I've never really enjoyed them Mm. I probably, when I was really young, yeah. you know, be before I was, I, I stopped doing this when I was about 23, I would take a certain amount of pleasure in being able to obtain intellectual victory. 
you know, it was also a way I defended myself when I was young and it was effective, but it's not the optimal way to conduct a conversation. This is one of the reasons why people like Rogan are so successful because Joe, Joe will push his point, mm. but he always does it in the service of learning. Yes. He doesn't do it in the service of victory. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I think I think you've probably put your finger on it there. Um, but what you were saying a moment ago about precision, about, about sort of thinking clearly and understanding somebody else clearly, I think the reason why I'm excited to speak to you today is because you're someone who celebrates being precise in your speech. Mm -hmm. And I've always appreciated your your desire to make sure that you're really understanding what somebody else is saying. I've made attempts in the past to, I mean, my channel is mostly focused on the philosophy of religion. Yes. Mm. And I've made attempts in the past to try to understand your worldview. Yeah, yeah, your I religious some worldview. of them. And I, I made a video essay. Some of the things I said there, I think, I th at least one thing in particular, I'd probably think I was wrong about, but what I was trying to do there, I, I've seen that people would ask you on, on interviews and podcasts, you know, do you believe in God? Do you think that Christianity is true? And, it was sort of, you, you would sort of struggle to answer the question. Hmm. And I thought to myself, well... People come at the question with a priori commitments about what they think truth constitutes. Yeah. That's a big problem. There, there must be something important that's being left out of the, the sort of precondition of that, of that question or conversation. Hmm. If, if it's so, if it's so... Hold on, you guys are in chat talking about saving people and you're saying like doctors save people's lives. Guys, this is a philosophy channel. When I say save people... We're talking in the sense of the character of the spirit. We're talking philosophy. We're not talking practicality. Doctors practically have to save their patients. It's a job. It's their job. So doctors have to save patients. It's their job. But we're talking about saving someone from their mistakes in a, sp in a character sense, right? This is very, very different. Psychologists and psychiatrists and all these people, their jobs require them a certain level of care for patients, but them as a person, their own personal motivation, very specifically different. Their own personal motivation is different than their job's motivation. For a lot of people, their job helps them be the person that they are. Because even Dr. K's talked about this, how Dr. K has said, you know, to do his line of work in psychology, you do have to be a little sociopathic. You have to be a little able to push people away because if you're too empathetic, you will be bad at your job. And so you have to stop yourself from becoming so weakened by the desire to save people, you actually end up smothering them and ruining their life. Like my first therapist was so afraid of having the consequences of um, like a patient who may be unalive themselves versus my second therapist who was very aware that, yeah, like she's in a hard line of work and she just treated it like a, okay, no problem. I totally get why you want to unalive. It makes sense for your life. Let's see if we can change that. And she did. She literally helped me change my perspective on wanting to unalive myself. And it wasn't like directly after therapy and boom. It was a little while after I made the decision to not do it. And that also coincided with philosophy, right? Like who I was as a person. But she didn't come at me like she was trying to save it, save me. She approached me like she was trying to problem solve this mystery ahead of herself, which I appreciated. I wanted to be treated as a mystery to be solved, not as someone to be saved because I had a sickness and she helped solve it. She didn't worry about whether or not she was saving me. Unimaginably difficult to answer, you know? Um, well, I'll give you an example. I, I watched that essay mm. this morning, ah. right? And I also wanted to talk to you about your discussion with Dawkins. Yeah. So people say, ask me, for example, do you believe in God? And I think, well, I don't know what you are driving at with mm. that question, because I don't know what you mean by believe. Most people, modern people, believe that a belief is a description of accordance with a set of facts. True. Sure. Right. Well, I don't True. think that's what belief means in the religious sense in the least. So I just think that's a non-starter. It's something to do with what you act out, right? It has to do with what you're... What you believe is what you're willing to die for, mm. fundamentally. It's what you're committed to or live for, if, if you think about it as life in the most extensive manner. It's a matter of commitment. So I understand what you what, what you mean in the religious context. Yeah. So, but religion is a big topic. Religion is is a is a is a mighty you know area to be to be talking about. But when I talk about belief in a more mundane sense, yeah. like I I believe that this chair exists. Yeah, like that is a belief that I hold. I, I sort of can't help but yes, hold that belief because I can see yeah, it. Right? Well, that's a place where your action and your statements 
aligned. Exactly. Right. Which is you why believe in the chair and you're sitting in it. It's like, fair which enough. Is, which is why I, I totally agree when you say that what you believe might really be what you act out. Mm -hmm. But I think when, when people are looking for essentially definitions, yeah. and just a second ago you said, well, what is it to believe? And you said, well, what you believe is what you're willing to die for. Yeah. I'm not willing to die for my belief that this chair exists. Maybe. Like, maybe in a broad <laughs> sense. So he doesn't, but he doesn't believe the chair exists. He knows it exists. He's sitting on it. But like, I, I think you're, when he says believe, he's talking about the thing you, the thing that makes sense f surrounding your own greater belief about what you're doing on the planet. It's a very Christian narrative, or at least a Catholic one, that you die for your faith in Christ. And I think that idea is very interesting. What am I willing to die for? Like, what would I be willing to die for now? Like, people say, like, oh, I'd be willing to die for my family. I mean, I'd be willing to die for a stranger. It's not that deep. Like, haven't you ever, you know, grabbed somebody off the side of the road if a car is coming or, like, got in the way of a child or, like, blocked a child from being hit by something? I mean, that's you willing to die for somebody else, right? It's just very, like, it's not even that deep if you think about it, if you're willing to do it for everybody. It's just your beliefs. It's not even that interesting. But people praise it like it's this great, amazing thing. But I think most people would probably make an effort to try to save like a child or even an old lady or something or even a man or whatever if they had the thought – if they thought about it, like if they could react in that way. But what are you willing to die for? What belief are you willing – I'm not – I don't think I'm willing to die for any belief. I'm willing to die for a lot of things. But maybe a belief is hard. Or maybe it's just the notion that I can do it. Hmm. If, 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 Maybe, if not believing, say, if not believing I, that the chair existed uh, required me to sort of give up my trust in my sense data, right. then I might literally die by accident by sort of walking off a cliff because I don't mm -hmm. trust my eyes mm -hmm. anymore. So there, there's, it's well, it's also sense. not something that you're likely to forego given your role, let's say, as a rational skeptic. Yeah, that's right. Seriously, like it's a commitment that you've made to a certain view of reality. But, but you understand surely that when somebody asks, do you believe in God, although they're asking... Uh, Love Jungle says he believes in the chair because he can't step outside of his five senses to double check if what he senses is telling him is actual reality. Okay, so he's talking about perception reality versus like object reality outside of space, time, and perception. Okay, okay, okay. The, the sort of subject of the belief yeah. is a much more grand uh, entity. The word belief itself, for them, at least in their question, even if you think it's an inappropriate question, yeah. they mean something much more mundane. They mean yeah. like you believe in the well, existence it's of hard to know. It's hard to know what people mean. You know, like mm. one of the things I've noticed, for example, is um, there are no shortage of Christian trolls, mm -hmm. right? I mean, there are atheist trolls and there's engineering trolls. There's lots of trolls, but there are Christian trolls. And the Christian trolls, when they ask that question, and it's often the Christian trolls who ask that question, what they mean is, are you in my club? Exactly. Right. Yeah. And my answer is, I'm not even sure you know what club you're in. <laughs> he just said, you don't even know the bubble you're in, bro. <laughs> That's pretty, I actually agree with this. Yeah. When people are, you know, they lecture you and lecture you and lecture you about. That's the, interesting that Jordan would say that. That's funny coming from him. But yeah, because sometimes I wonder if he knows what bubble he's in, like what club he thinks he's a part of. Um, he's probably not a part of any. I actually think Jordan Peterson probably struggles to find his bubble. And he usually has a bunch of bubbles who want him on his on their side. But I don't know if Jordan himself is a part of a community bubble in the sense in a, in a sense. I actually think him and Tammy probably have their own little bubble. Like I think his family bubble is probably his his focus and inner circle. You know what I mean? I think Jordan and his kids and his wife, they seem to have like a really good relationship. So there's a trap in the question, which I don't appreciate because mm -hmm. I don't like questions that have traps in them. Yes. Um, now, not, not everybody who's asking that question has a trap, but many people do. And so I find that uh, off-putting, let's yeah. say, because it's manipulative. In mm -hmm. terms of that that descriptive belief, that's something we could go into. I think we should do that because sure. it does get to the core of the matter that you were attempting to untangle, let's say, in your essay. Yeah, I mean, my, my understanding of, of, and I had to sort of piece together different things you'd said in different interviews. And I suppose the reason I had to do that was because I didn't have you in front of me. So I'm grateful to have the opportunity now. It seems, yeah, yeah. It seems to me that when you speak of God, you mean something like that which is at the, I don't know if you'd rather say the basis or the top, 
at the basis Either. or the top Both metaphors of work. a value hierarchy. Mm -hmm. And it begins with the recognition that anything that anybody does requires some kind of value. Even just to do something as, as simple mm -hmm. as sitting in a chair or picking up a glass. Well, you don't do value. anything without it being oriented towards a value. Exactly, right. And so e even to perceive the glass is something you've spoken about before. You know, why do I see the glass as one object? Mm -hmm. uh, even though it's got multiple parts, it's got a side and a bottom and top. I, I see them together in a way that I don't see mm -hmm. the, the cup and the table as one object. Well, you said before, it's because I can grip it. Mm -hmm. It's sort of functional. It's because I can use this Great. cup. And the reason that I see it in that way is because I can then drink from it. And the reason that I, I want to do that is because I sort of value my health. And, mm -hmm. and there's sort of a, a value uh, regress mm -hmm. that goes on. Mm -hmm. and, Always. And more broadly, this, this comes out in the question of like, you know, why are you writing an essay to get a good grade? Or why, you're writing, why do you want a good grade to get a good job? Why do you want a good job to get money? And, and you keep going back and back. It has to terminate somewhere. That's right. Because otherwise there would be nothing to sort of lend that that value. Well, otherwise you'd always be in an infinite regress. Further down. Right? Or, you'd or, just die of or questioning. Or it would be infinite. Yeah, you, you literally, you, you're, it's the kind of um, regress in which the value that you have for, for A actually borrows the value from, from B. You don't, you, don't, right. you don't value A at all without B. Mm -hmm. So it doesn't get it without B. And mm -hmm. B doesn't That's get it right. without C. And C doesn't get it without D. So if yeah. that went on infinitely, there's nothing to give the, the entire sequence value in the first place. Right. And so there's got to be something at the basis here. And then mm -hmm. you said, at least on, on one occasion, that we'll call that place, whatever's at the top there, we'll call it the divine place. Yeah, and you said, right. we'll make that a that's matter, a matter of, of definition. definition. Yeah, yeah. Now, I'm kind of, I'm fine with this. Yeah. But it seems to me that, that what you're doing is you're giving a definition of God mm -hmm. that makes him, Partial definition. or makes it, him, whatever, unavoidably exist and also makes it a quite different entity to the entity described by a great deal of, for instance, your Christian, uh, your Christian listeners, who will say that God is not the, the basis of a value hierarchy. Mm -hmm. God is an omnipotent, omniscient, agential being with mm -hmm. consciousness that intentionally mm -hmm. brings about human beings and sent down a physical man to sacrifice his life in order mm -hmm. to save us from our sins. Now, that means that when someone asks you, does God exist? And you say, well, look, I, I think that's a, that's almost an inappropriate question. I, I, in, at times you sort of imply that you don't even believe in atheists because you sort of act as if you believe in God. Mm -hmm. If what you mean by God is just... Well, Dawkins himself admitted he was a cultural Christian. That's, like that's another weeks, matter, because so. that's much more specific. I mean, that's yeah. cultural Christianity, yeah, right? This yeah, is just... Yeah. This, but although but he it's been, a reflection been saying that the for years. problem. But, but, you know, when, someone, when a Christian says to you, I, I'm being very clear that that's what I mean by God, I don't know if you do believe in the omniscient, omnipotent, agential being, but... Mm. If you start talking about the inevitability of believing in some basis of a value hierarchy, well, it's hierarchy, not so obvious. You're talking it's about not so obvious from the traditional Judeo-Christian perspective that God is properly conceptualized as a being. Oh. That's that's so, probably right. Well, too. so so it's tricky, right? Because yeah. one of the ways that you can approach God traditionally is in relationship to a being, but that's mm -hmm. a veil. So why do I say that? Okay, so so let's speak about it religiously first. And then we can speak about it conceptually. So there's a tremendous insistence in the Judeo-Christian tradition that God is outside of the categorical structure, right? Like mm -hmm. seriously outside. Elijah, the prophet, establishes that God is not in nature. He's not in the earthquake. He's not in the conflagration. He's not in the storm, right? So mm -hmm. that doesn't mean that nature doesn't speak of God, but it does mean that whatever God is, is not in the natural world. Okay, now we can extend that. Not bound by time, not bound by space. Well, does that make God a material object? Because when people say, is God real, which is a variant of the question, is do you believe in God? It's like, mm. well, God's immaterial and outside of time and space. So if your definition of real is material things yep. in the domain of time and space, then we're not talking about the same thing. Now, usually people approach that question of belief with some materialistic framework like that in mind, even if they don't know it. Yes. The Christians, let's say, um, who put this question forward in the hope of getting the answer they want to hear are materialistic and enlightenment minds, even though they don't know it, mm. because they have an implicit definition of what constitutes real. Is God real? It's like, no, no, God's hyper real. That's not the same thing. I think that the, the physicality of God is an interesting question. Yeah. In, the, in the Old Testament tradition, it seems to evolve as, as far as I can see. If you look mm -hmm. at some of the, the earlier descriptions of, of God, you've got, a God who, you've got a God who walks through the Garden of Eden. Yeah. You've got a God who has a, a council of, 
of of angels and, yeah. and, the, and the accuser. You have a sort of, it's being at least conceptualized as a much more physical being. And as time goes on, God becomes uh, less localized. And I, I've heard a lot of theories as to why that's the case. I've just done an episode on my own show. Yeah, I'm not, I'm not sure that's true, exactly. I don't think there's a clear historical progression like that. There is a constant tension between yep. God as ineffable and then God as manifest in a manner that's comprehensible, mm -hmm. right? And if, so Mircea Eliade had mapped the consequences of this out to some degree. So he was very interested in Nietzsche's proposition that God had died. Mm -hmm. Most people, including Nietzsche, regarded that as like a unique historical event. There was a religious tradition, the Enlightenment arose. In consequence, we became skeptical about God. And in 1850, the philosophers decided that he was no longer necessary or real. But Eliade, who, who is a brilliant historian of religions, has noted that this has happened many, many times that God has vanished, disappeared. Mm -hmm. And one of his explanations for that is that a God that's too ineffable, so that's completely outside of the categories of time and space, let's say, and who doesn't make himself present as a being, who doesn't have a heavenly council, who has no hierarchy between the pinnacle and earth itself, tends to float off into space. It becomes so abstract that you can't yes. have a relationship with it, him, in, in, and then he disappears. In many ways, this is what Christianity provides with the New Testament. He disappeared when the world needed him the most. So that begs the question, did God disappear 2,000 years ago and end up in an iceberg? Hmm. Testament and the figure of Jesus. And that's why I think for a lot of Christians, the more important question for you and the, yeah. the question that they're interested in, and, and you're quite right that a lot of people are like, I want to get you on my team. Yeah. I have mm. no dog in this fight. I'm not a Christian. The people always want people on their teams, especially Jordan Peterson, which is so interesting. Christian. Yeah. But I know that a lot of Christians are frustrated when they begin asking about Jesus, who's a much more physical entity. Mm -hmm. right? It's a real human being. It's someone mm -hmm. of flesh and blood. Mm -hmm. It's someone who's physically crucified by yeah, the It's Romans. a very different question. It's a very different question. And then, and then is, is seen as a physical entity, mm -hmm. at least according to the, to the canonical tradition, by his disciples after he died. Yeah. So when somebody asks you, do you believe that that happened? Mm -hmm. And when I've seen you ask about that question, you tend to still speak in terms of the psychological and the mythological. I think the frustration is that, as you've just said, yeah. That, These are two I don't mind frustrating right? Christians on in that regard either, because the truth of the matter is, with regard to the gospel accounts, that the mythological and the historical are inextricably, inextricably cross-contaminated. Sure, there's no pulling out the historical Jesus, right? That just that's that's a non-starter. The and why that is, I don't know. It's it's very it's very mysterious. It's very hard to understand. As is are are the let's say the accounts of the resurrection. Okay, so what do I think about that? Well, I don't. I think that denying the historical reality of Christ is. I think that's just a fool's errand. I of course, don't know why anybody would bother with so, it? So, so a man exists called Jesus. We yes. have that much. Now, Christ. Now, there's a claim that that is attributed to Christ that he is the embodiment or the incarnation, the fulfillment, let's say, of the prophet and the laws. Yes, I think that's true. Uh -huh. Yeah. What does that mean? Well, you know. What did, I think it's in the Gospel of John. I think Gospel of John closes with a statement that something like, if all the books that were ever yes. written were written about the Gospel accounts, that wouldn't be enough books to explain what had happened. Yeah, if, if it was like, like if yes. all the things that Jesus did. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And it's and it's there's a there's a truth in that. The truth is that profound religious account is bottomless. Mm -hmm. And the biblical representations are like that. There's no limit to the amount of investigation they can bear, not least because the text in itself is deeply cross-referenced. So there's like, there's an innumerable number of paths through it. It's like a chessboard. And so it, it's, it's inexhaustible in its interpretive space. That's true. And, th and that's a problem too, because it, it means it's also susceptible to multiple interpretations, including potentially competing interpretations. I think a lot of people interpret Paul, for example, um, uh, the earliest New Testament source, as saying that if Jesus did not literally rise from the dead, mm -hmm. if, if there was not a man who stopped breathing and then started breathing again, then your faith is futile and you're still mm -hmm. in your sins. That is, Christianity is undermined. Mm -hmm. Now, mm -hmm. that means that, and Paul doesn't say 
sort of believing that that's false is really bad. He says, if you do not believe this proactively, yeah. then your faith is, yeah, is futile. Yeah, the problem so, I so have with if, that. If you don't proactively yeah. believe that yourself, then I think when... A Can I ask, why, why do people, if, you, if anyone in this audience feels this way, why do people struggle with the resurrection? I've never quite understood that. And look, I grew up Roman Catholic. My parents are daily mass goers. Like my family goes to mass daily. My farm brother takes all his kids and his wife daily to church. So I, you know, and I grew up going to Bible study and debates and all this stuff. So like I was heavily involved, but I never really understood why people struggled with the resurrection. I mean, we're talking about God. You're saying God can't resurrect. We're saying like God can't bring Lazarus back from the dead. Like I don't, I've never really understood what was people's problem with the resurrection. Why do people struggle with that? Does anyone come from a different religious background or a different bubble where that you could explain it? It just makes no sense to me that people would struggle with this idea. As he says, evidence. Ryan says, I can't know if the resurrection happened. Who saw it? What we, you've never even seen God. If we're already going to believe in God, what's so hard about believing in a resurrection? You know what I mean? It doesn't make any sense to me. I mean, if the whole idea is like, I didn't see the resurrection. I have no evidence for it. Who cares? You believe in a God. What do you need evidence for all of a sudden? That's why it doesn't make sense. Right? Like how, how would it be? I don't even know what we're talking about. Like you believe in a God, but not a resurrection. Like a lot of the people that seem to have an issue with the resurrection aren't non-believers. They're different religious people. Or maybe they are non-believers. Is that the issue? Because non-believers not believing the resurrection is fine. You don't even believe in God. But if you believe in God, why would you have a problem with the resurrection? Discourse said it's the fundamental cornerstone of the faith. So if it's fake, the religion is gone. Jews and Muslims exist due to it. Every religion is fake. Every religion is fake, you know, because they have to update it. Right? Like, the way you know a religion is fake is because of the way that it was constructed. And it's not fake in a sense. Like, I don't think anyone has a, a true line to Christ or to God. So we're just trusting the man to convey that relationship with Christ or God or whatever your religious thing is. Many religions see death as permanent. Not if you believe in God. Like, that doesn't make any sense. Yeah, Kenny says God can make all things possible. Ex no, exactly. Like, if God can make all things possible, why are we even doubting the possibility that God could rise from the dead? Like, it just seems so weird to be like, I think God can do all these things. Yo, go. But when it comes to dead people, absolutely not. And it's like, Don't you all believe in the afterlife? Like death isn't even the only, it's not even permanent. Sleepy says some struggle with the resurrection because they want Catholicism to be just like Halloween and Christmas. A tradition that they love requires no sacrifice of their logic, I guess. But is it, it's not that illogical to think the resurrection happened. It's all, with, all, with God, all things are possible, right? That's the saying. Toad says it's just hard to be religious when I, as a kid you grew up given the choice to go to church or not because I'd rather watch Spongebob and watercolor. I mean, hey, you know, not all really relations believe that gods are all powerful. Okay, well, this one does. Yeah, it's just interesting. Cam says I grew up in a religion where God, Jesus, and the Holy Spirit is three separate things and Jesus died to get to buy back what Adam lost. Okay, interesting, interesting. Okay, Ryan says, I don't think people have a problem with the resurrection. I just feel like the Bible is a metaphorical. Yeah, okay, interesting. Huh. All right. Hmm. When a Christian asks you, you know, do you believe in the resurrection of Jesus? Are you a Christian? I think you must be committed to saying no, at least under that interpretation of Paul. <laughs> uh, and, and even if you're not sure, I mean, it's fine if, if I say to you, do you think that a man physically rose from the dead? And you say something like, well, I don't know. I mean, I wasn't there but hmm. I think it has a lot of mythological significance or I think that maybe it, it happened in a, in a different sense or it happened in the sense that good fiction happens, you know, hmm. then fine. But it needs to begin with that caveat of, of the simple sort of, hmm. historically speaking, I don't know. And I know you don't like to pull out the historical well, oh, Jesus well, that, and the mythological, that's a, that's but, a good objection. but it's an it's important a, question to ask. No, of course, it's a very good objection. I think this is fine from an atheist perspective to argue this, like, we'll know if God is real from historical... This is why I do not live my life debunking religion. Because to debunk a religion is to debunk what is faith, and faith never needed evidence in the first place. People don't be believe in God because they have tangible evidence. They believe in God because they have the faith and a relationship with the Spirit. So it doesn't make any sense to me that 
you would try to debunk religious people out of their religion because of evidence. If evidence was enough, like they're fi- going to find themselves out of it eventually anyways. Right. So it's kind of interesting. But the idea that the resurrection is like historically significant, like people would have remembered it. We don't even know if history is right. I was just we'll talking, we were talking about Rome earlier and we we're talking about Nero and we were talking about like, who knows if any of this is right? We have no idea if any of this is correct. If when your own mother remembers how your life was and gets things wrong, how are we not going to get history wrong? So it's kind of interesting how much people think they know. I'm shocked and I can't tell if it's the ego of men to think that they know history, but history is not what it seems, but it can teach us things all the same. It just feels weird to be like, I need the resurrection to be historically accurate. What part of history was ever historically accurate? We are literally arguing today what happened 100 years ago, let alone 2,000 years ago. It's just strange. So the so I just did a seminar on the Gospels with a crew of about eight people. And it was the same crew that walked through Exodus with me with yeah. a couple of variations. And we spent a lot of time on the resurrection accounts, for example. And... Of course, that was the toughest, let's say, that was the toughest morsel to chew and digest. The thing about the resurrection accounts is that they're all, look, so I could say something like this, which will just annoy people, but it doesn't matter. I believe the accounts, but I have no idea what they mean. When you say you believe the accounts, do you mean, and and I I hate to be sort of pedantic here, it seems pedantic, but do you mean you believe that these are things that happened such that mm-hmm. if I, if that's, now, that's a strange I know you don't state. like that. Let me put it this way. Yeah. If, if I. <laughs> Being very, I like the, I like the specificity with words. I actually think it's really important. TMM says I encounter a lot of folks who insist they reason their way to Jesus using evidence and logic. They're probably in the minority of Christians, but they're out there. Oh, I meet them all the time. I agree with you. I have a priest friend who's quite educated and he says the same things. He's like, if you want to believe in God because of evidence, I have evidence. But the evidence isn't the evidence that would take. It's not the same kind of evidence. It's like, oh, well, we believe in the Big Bang and the Big Bang came from somewhere and that somewhere was God. That's not evidence. In order to get to that point, you have to fill in a missing gap. There's a missing gap of information. That's where your faith comes in, which is fine. But to them, that's evidence. And to me, that's not evidence that it. you didn't tell me anything. It's like the same people that think like, oh, my gosh, people who are trans also have a lot of autism and borderline. Oh, my gosh, this all must be connected. I was like, well, are they connected or are they related, which is not the same thing? You know, does one mean the other or like it's like you're jumping to conclusions because you see something and this isn't to me good thinking. I want details. I want it moved. I want I want every like this way, the way they're talking right now, Alex and Jordan, they're like being very specific about words. I want this. I want the specific thing about language and what we're saying to make sure we are saying the same thing, because I swear to God, every conversation I have with people, I'm like, we're not saying the same thing. We're using the same words, but we're not saying the same thing. So when you say I have evidence, we're not talking about the same kind of evidence, girl. We ain't talking about the same kind of evidence, you know? I went back in time with a Panasonic video camera and put that camera in front of the tomb of Joseph of Arimathea. Would the little LCD screen show a man walk out of that tomb? I mean, would God have fucked with the videotape so you wouldn't have been able to see it? Men think they're so powerful. Like even this hypothetical, which I love, is still really silly because it insinuates like God doesn't intervene or there isn't like if you believe in magic, the idea of like this thing existing or not existing, that's interesting. Let's see what Jordan says, though, if he's asking Jordan the literal question, because that's interesting as well. Obviously, my family believes all of this, right? My family believes it to a T that it happened, the resurrection, you know, all of those things, Lazarus, like everything, like that happened legit. Mary was visited by the angel. Everything is literal to them. So. I would say suspect yes. Oh. So that, that is, that to me seems like. Rewind. Did I miss something? Would the little LCD screen show a man. Wait. Panasonic video camera and put that camera in front of the tomb of Joseph of Arimathea. Oh. Would the little LCD screen show a man walk out of that tomb? I would suspect yes. 
So that that is that to me seems like a belief in the historical event of the resurrection, or at least of Jesus leaving the tomb. Which means that when somebody says, you know, do you believe that Jesus rose from the dead? It doesn't seem clear to me why you're not able to just say, it would seem to me yes. So wait, Jordan just said he does he does think that it would show that, like he does believe in that. That's so interesting. Because I have no idea what that means. And neither did the people who saw it. Do you guys know the miracle, uh, the, the day the sun danced, when Mother Mary appeared, um, and the day the sun danced for the kids? My family references this as like being documented, newspapers talked about it, everybody referenced it. Like 50,000 people I think were there to witness it. I think I, I'm probably getting the number incorrect. But I think about that all the time. Look, I'm not opposed to God existing. I'm not opposed to any of the things that we imagine being like magical or otherworldly. But I am curious on what it means because there's a an assumption that if this means this, then this means this. And I don't know if that's true. I don't know if men are, you know, women or men are waking up from the dead, if that means anything. I'm not sure if we saw a zombie apocalypse, if that means a virus got out or God is giving us the plague. None of these things feel like answers. They feel like assumptions. And I want the answer. I don't want to live off the assumption. Let's see. Selena says, so he's saying it happened and people put their own meaning on it. Maybe. Is that what he's saying? Because it could have happened, but we don't know what it means. I mean, people have definitely died and come back to life in our world because we have the technology. But it's not the same as being dead for three days and then coming back, right? That's a little unique. I mean, I suppose one of... Look, let, here's, here's, let's, let's, let's approach this obliquely, let's say. Yeah. The miracle of the loaves and the fishes. Yeah. Mm. Okay. So people will say, well, do you believe that happened literally, mm -hmm. historically? It's like, well, yes, I believe that. It's okay. Okay. What do you mean by that? That you believe that? Yeah. Exactly. What do you mean? Yeah. So, so you tell me you're there in the way that you described. Right. right. And what do you what see? What are the fish what do you doing? Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> and the, the answer is you yes. don't know. You have no notion about it at all. You have no theory about it. Sure. So your belief is, what's your belief exactly? Well, I think a Christian might say something like, my belief is that I have no idea looking at those fish what I would see in the process of them being converted into enough food for the 5,000 to eat. I have no idea what I would see. But I do know that what I would see is the fish end up being spread amongst the 5,000. In the same way, right, right. I'd, like if I opened up... Discord says Jordan left an out for himself there. He said he would see someone come out of the tomb. That's much different than saying, I believed he literally resurrected. As always, Peterson left himself an out, which is probably good. There's something really good about that. You know what I mean? Like, I think he's right. As he says, Peterson is arguing against true certainty, which I think is really, really valid. I think to know, and I say this all the time, right? Most people believe things we rarely very much know. There's very few things I know and very few things I believe, but I believe a lot more than I know. And most people do. The whole universe, all of our civilization has built mostly off of what we believe to be true, right? We're really lucky that as a species, we haven't needed to know that much to get this far. And we've advanced pretty freaking far. So absolute certainty, I do think it is reasonable to not assume you are absolutely certain. Because again, this whole like gun to your head, are you sure you're certain? I wish somebody could pull that trigger and we could know, but we can't, you know? So I think there's something good about that. There's something respectable about that. I wish he would do that when it came to trans people. I wish he was just as cautious with the human like lives he impacts as he is with the God who probably doesn't exist. Good conversation so far, really liking it. The, the water jar, what would I see when the water became wine? I have no idea. Does it sort of blend from one color into another? Does it mm. suddenly snap? Mm -hmm. Does it disappear and then mm -hmm. reappear? I don't know. Right. But what right. I do know as a Christian is that I would see something at some event in which when I look at the beginning, it's water. And when I look at the end, it's wine. And I mean, actually, I don't mean that Jesus turning water into wine is some kind of, you know, uh, inextricably mythological story and the question of whether it happened sort of doesn't matter or maybe it happened in a meta manner or maybe it happened in a in a hyper reality sense. I, I, I would be as See, a Christian I, committed I'm to saying that it, that, it, that it happened rather, historically. More, I'm more inclined rather than to believe. I'm more inclined to understand. And then when I hit the limits of my understanding, I think, I don't understand that. Oh, now, yeah. do I believe it or not believe it? I think often, especially with regards to 
biblical matters, let's mm-hmm. say, I'm, I, do, I have a suspension of belief and disbelief. Yeah, and, and that, that's fine too. I of think course. part of the reason that I've been able to be an effective interpreter of the biblical texts and a relatively scientific interpreter is because I approach the texts with respect, the mm. same respect that I would approach a lab animal. I don't know what this is. Like, I seriously don't know. Mm. And I'm not going to come at it with axiomatic assumptions that are unquestionable. I'm going to try to see what's right in front of my eyes. I'm going to try to see what mystery reveals itself if I take this phenomenon seriously. Mm. This is one of the things that I find puzzling, for example, about Dawkins. Because Dawkins formulated the idea of meme, Mm -hmm. which is, by the way, the same idea as archetype. It's exactly the same idea, except he just stopped. It's like, okay, there are memes. They're selected for. Okay, selected on what basis exactly? Does that mean there's a hierarchy of memes? Are the memes more likely, that are the memes that are conserved more likely to be, what would you say, viable organisms? This and if is, they're viable yeah. organisms, are they microcosms? This is really interesting uh, in, in terms of the survivability because there's a point, I, I've spoken to Richard Dawkins, well, a, a, a number of times, but twice on my podcast. And the second time, somebody pointed out to me that there might be a point of agreement between you two that, that mm. has been overlooked, which is that I don't know if you've ever come across the, the evolutionary argument against naturalism or the argument from reason, the idea that if you're a materialist, you can't trust your, your reasonable faculties. So Alvin Plantinga formulated this very well, very, very geniusly, I think, in saying that if you believe that evolution by natural selection happens materially, what does natural selection select for? Survivability. Mm-hmm. So if you're a materialist, that means that the very rational faculty that you're using right now evolves not to be sensitive to truth, but to yeah. survivability. Yes, that's and right. And if that's the case, well, Definitely. Why, why do you believe in the truth of evolution? Well, because you've been rationally convinced of it. Well, the Darwinian definition of true and the Newtonian oh, definition sure. of true it, well, exactly are not right. so, the so, same So here's thing. the thing. Here's the thing. You uh, had a conversation with Sam Harris. Yeah. You've had you've had a number, but yeah. one of them, yeah. I don't think it was a live event. I think it was before that. You're talking about truth. Yeah. And you're, was you're a very trying awkward to awkward <laughs> first second talk I had with him. I was, was extremely ill. It was. It was do you know, it was awkward to listen to because it felt very much like, and I remember at the time thinking, you know, what is this this Jordan Peterson talking about? Like truth is like Darwinian, truth mm-hmm. is about like survivability. Well, what do you mean? Truth is truth. True the way an arrow flies. Yeah, right. Mm-hmm. And that, right. Now, now I asked Richard Dawkins about the evolutionary argument against naturalism. Yeah. And I said, well, well, how can you know that what you believe is true? And he said, because believing true things makes me more likely to survive. Hey, hey, and oh, I, boy, and watch where you go with I that, I didn't catch man. it at the time, but I thought to myself, Afterwards, it was one of my commenters on 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 Patreon actually had had mentioned this. He was listening to Richard, and I said, "But you know, but okay, maybe, but sometimes it's at least possible that something that's false helps you to survive. You know, the rustling in the bushes, believing that that's a lion every time or a tiger, mm-hmm. even if it's not, that helps you to survive because that one time that it is, you're still going to run away, and it costs you nothing to run away when it's not a tiger. So, believing it's a tiger, even when it's not." It's mm-hmm. going to help me to That's survive. That's why we have a negativity bias. Yeah. And, and, mm-hmm. and Dawkins says, well, yeah, of course, there are some circumstances where believing something false could be beneficial to survival. Mm-hmm. And I said, well, how do you know that two plus two equals four is not one of those? Mm-hmm. And it seemed as though he, would, he, he was just saying that believing that would not be advantageous to our survival, which right. might well be true. But if that's the case, then suddenly I'm listening to what you're saying about uh, truth being more sort of Darwinian and related to survivability. And I think maybe you two would agree there. And then I think, well, why is it that when you sit down with Richard Dawkins, you find it difficult to have a conversation with each other? Because they live in different bubbles. They're in completely different bubbles. Jordan Peterson and Dawkins, just they're so different. Like, I don't really like Dawkins very much. And I like Jordan Peterson... Uh, not very much, but I like Jordan Peterson way more than I like Dawkins. And I think that's saying something. You know what I mean? Shout out to Jordan Peterson, I guess. Well, I think it's partly because we don't know each other very well. Well, it's partly because y'all drown in your egos. Though I think Dawkins is more in his ego than Peterson is. Peterson's in his fear and Dawkins is in his ego. And I find that frustrating. That's that's, that's right. And so, and also, uh, there are things he knows that I don't know. Yeah. And there are things I know that he doesn't know. Mm-hmm. Now, I would say in my defense that I, what would you say? I'm more of the aware, aware of the things he knows that I don't know than he is of the things I know that he doesn't know. Yeah. Right? Uh-huh. So, for example, 
As far yeah. as I can tell, Dawkins doesn't know anything about the Jungian tradition of literary interpretation. Mm -hmm. And that actually, if you're going to talk about religion, that's actually a fatal flaw, mm -hmm. right? So, and, you know, he's called me, for example, drunk on symbols. It's like, well, the imagination is a biological function. Mm. And it has a structure and a purpose. Mm -hmm. And it has its own logos, its own intelligible yes. order. And if you're not aware of that order, that doesn't make me drunk on symbols. It just means you don't know what you're talking about. Now, that, so, that, that frustration that, that you uh, appeal to there, when you, mm -hmm. when you hear Richard Dawkins, um, I think Terry Eagleton said that listening to Dawkins on theology is like listening to somebody write a book about biology whose only knowledge of the subject is having once read the great British book of birds. Mm -hmm. And okay, fair enough. Mm -hmm. That, but that actually turns out to be a real problem. But, and it's a problem with regards even to- Jordan does the same thing. All these men stick their nose into too many topics that aren't in their lane. I think that's more or less what it is. I think people are not sticking to their niches, which to be fair, I understand that temptation, but I do think that's probably more or less what's happening. So instead of looking at one another as a possibly like shared pool of knowledge, we're looking at each other like, oh, I can compete with you. I want to play the game you're playing. It's like Jordan is so good when it comes to so many things. But sometimes I think he steps into bubbles that aren't his or lanes that aren't his thing. And Dawkins definitely tries to do that. It's interesting. Africa says Dawkins is more honest, but more obtuse and difficult. That's interesting. I find Jordan to be more honest than Dawkins. But see, that's probably a bubbles difference. Like Jordan feels very much like he wears his heart on his sleeve. He's so open, which is annoying sometimes because it's inappropriate. And Dawkins feels much more just close-minded and sure of himself, which is frustrating. But he could be honest in that. There's an honesty in that, right? Ryan says, how do you know what your lane is? Well, in this in this context, it would be this, the specific things that you've dedicated your life to. Like Jordan's dedicated his life to therapy and psychology. I mean, he's a scientist. He's a doctor, right? And uh, Dawkins is a scientist. He's, well, in a different way, right? And then it's like these people have dedicated decades and decades and decades of their life to studying a specific thing. And then they're hopping around, which is interesting. But the temptation for that is clear as I'm reading through Determined by Robert Spolosky, who also is a scientist, but now he's getting into, he wants to talk about morals and he wants to talk about what society should do. And he talks about politics and he wants to talk about like, uh, it's funny because ultimately I do think if you're curious and you're interested in these things and you're a man who's interested in people and ultimately these men are interested in people, you're going to end up wanting to talk about what people should do. You know, you're going to want to talk about what people should do. And that's makes sense. All Sam, Dawkins, Robert, and Jordan are all more feminine in that sense. They're interested in people, but they figure it out through like things. But they're all interested in people. All of them are studying ultimately people. That's why they dedicate their life to talking to people and trying to be involved in some way in, in politics, which is interesting. You know, in philosophy, it's why they all like philosophy, you know. Um, Mabo says, who is more intellectually honest? I think they're both. I think Peterson and, and Dawkins, I would say are, are equally intellectually honest. What do you guys think though? You know, I think in their own ways, but they're still human. So they have flaws, you know, they, they're, everyone's always going to have flaws, right? To the meme idea, because you don't have to extend Dawkins work very far to understand that religious stories are memes. Sure. Right. Okay. Yeah. Well, and, and there's a hierarchy of memes but then, and some of them are very functional. But then here's the thing, like that frustration that you're sort of throwing in that direction. Yeah. I think people throw it throw towards you and when, when, when you say, well, religion, you don't have to look very far to see that religion is a meme. You can understand why to, to somebody first listening, that sounds almost atheistic or religion is a meme. No, right? religion is not. Religion is not. You know the the history of the universe. Oh, it's not a true historical it's, account. It's a meme. Now, it's, now, it it when you say that when you say that the resurrection of Jesus. Well, what does it mean historically? If God brooded upon the primordial waters, like what does that mean historically? Well, no one, no one knows. I what agree. That means I don't historically. think. I don't think right. that at least most of Genesis or parts of Genesis are supposed to be, I mean, the, the, the Bible is a, is, a, is a library, right? It's not a book. And that means that it's going to contain different genres. That's for sure. And so when we know- Yeah, and some it, of them are more historically accurate and some of them tilt more towards 
that that kind of elusive i don't mean elusive in the i mean a l l u s i v yeah sure right that that elusive and symbolic form that characterizes so, genesis 1 so sure. because, because there are different genres here it depends on what story we're talking about and i That's think that what, sure. what i often observe you doing is we might talk about uh christianity and if you aren't comfortable committing to a historical ideal you'll start talking about the the spirit moving over the face of the waters which is which is obviously a much more mythological ideal mm-hmm. um and not not quite equivocating them but but moving between them too quickly and mm-hmm. and not delineating them enough so if if i asked you you know do you think that the spirit moved across the face of the waters and you said to me something like i think it's still happening right I'd that say, is what i would I'd say. say hey fair enough yeah, yeah. I mean, that makes sense it However, always happens it some, happened at the beginning of time and it's always happening when somebody yeah. says did the Exodus story happen? Did mm-hmm. did the did the Jews enslaved in Egypt break free of their slavery and move to the Promised Land across the desert for for forty years? Mm-hmm. Did that happen? Mm-hmm. You have also said of the Exodus specifically, it's still happening. Yes. Now, to me, that's far more inappropriate than mm. saying that the spirit is still moving across the face of the waters, because I think what people mean there is: Do you believe that these people in that time period? actually did this in such a way that, for instance, might show up in an archaeological report. Well, I think... You know, it's interesting. I was talking to uh, a former religious friend, and we were discussing, like, this idea about the Egyptians enslaving the Jews and how somebody had confronted them and said, like, that didn't happen the way your Bible says it happened. And they're like, well, what do you mean? And if you look it up, there is some sort of misunderstanding of biblical history, history in this way. This idea of Moses and enslavement and the way that it occurred and the way that the Jews were targeted. Some people feel like that is truly a Western mythology. That that isn't how other people see history and that that is specific to people who grew up with the Bible as sort of their history. And that was sort of like a bubble pop where you have this realization of like, you got to be careful when you're born, no matter where you're born. To realize like the way you hear about how life goes for people could be dictated by a book or a bubble or a whatever, a belief system. And it's not about being bad or good or evil. Everyone has this. It's not universal to like the West. But it is sort of interesting when you realize like, oh, wait, were the Jews even enslaved in the way that we hear it talked about? Is this true or is this the way that our religion tells the story? Because narrative is so important. Like narrative really tells you how to feel about what's happening today because you think it's a continuum of what happened before. Like you think it is literally a follow-up from what's happened in the past, which might not be true. It might not be true. And so you're thinking, well, today makes sense because this happened 2,000 years ago. But like, did it? Did it? And are people in leadership positions literally saying, this is why we have to do what we're doing now because of what happened before? But if it never happened before, then why are we doing it now? It's interesting what story we tell ourselves so we can like justify our actions. I think that I think that's the simplest answer to that is probably. Sure. And that's right. that's fine too. But then But we don't know. But then but I then, mean there is, like to the degree that there's been archaeological investigations into the kinds of biblical narratives that you've described, the archaeological evidence tends to fall on the side of historical accuracy in yeah. relationship to the Bible, quite surprisingly clearly, I mean, often. Clearly, you're, 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 I mean, you've you spent more time in Exodus than probably any person I've ever met in person, right? Clearly, the story sort of captivates you and you think it's really important and, and, and can, no, it's can teach remarkable. us a lot, right? Yeah. Of course. It's an infinitely deep but story. I think most people speaking to you already know that you think that, right? Mm-hmm. And so when they ask you a question, when, when they suddenly say to you, but do you think it really happened? Well, what the hell does that mean? You, 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 you must know that what they mean is what I was talking about a second ago, which is that sort of... Um, what, what? Okay, so fine. So it's easy just to turn this again, around. It's, it's like, okay, what exactly happened in, in your historical account when Moses encountered the burning bush? I don't need to know exactly what happened. What I need to know is I'm, that, I'm not asking you specifically I know, I know. or, or what, attacking you for that. What I need just, to know is that if I sort of went to the Egyptian desert sort of the time that this story is alleged to have take, taken place in history, would I see a mass movement of Israelites 
from Egypt into the Promised Land? Would I see people with feet walking through the desert, leaving footprints? Well, I, let's 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 take it apart rationally. So, and, and, but you also understand that when when someone's asking that, and you, you like, even if you don't like the question, you must understand what someone's oh, asking. Oh yes, that, well, and I, if that's the I case, understand most, many of the things that they're doing simultaneously. Then you, you must also understand that when you then say it's still happening, yeah, people just go, "What are you talking about?" Yeah, well, I would say that's not my problem. Hmm. But it's it's. It becomes a problem when you understand that someone's asking a quite banal historical question. Yeah, but you don't get to do that. But why not? Because the stories that you're dealing with aren't banal. I agree, but like... Uh, one so you can't reduce them to... Mm, okay, hold on. Africa says, see, this is what I mean by honestly, he knows what a biblical literist is asking. Well, you know what's interesting? Is sometimes I find myself being a Peterson where I'll be like, well, what do you mean by belief? And like, what do you do? like it, there's a temptation for people to trap you in your answers. But that doesn't quite mean anything to say that I believe it, right? It doesn't quite mean anything to say that I believe something because believing doesn't mean that it's true. And even if, if he really understands what the word belief is, then even to believe is to say, I don't know. So when people hear him say, I believe there were like Moses was in the desert and he parted the Red Sea or Moses like took 40 people into the sea and there was a, you know, he went to the burning bush and he came down and, you know, his, they started worshiping cattle and all these things. It's still not something he knows. It's still something he just believes, which still doesn't mean anything. But people will start to say, oh, he's literally believes it. So it changes everything, but it might not change anything to believe in something is not to literally know something is real, nor does it mean to literally believe something unless, unless you are given opportunity to prove that belief is so strong that you would, what Peterson said, die for it. The only time belief is real is when you're willing to die for it. This isn't a literal, like it's not literal, but it's supposed to be a metaphorical literal, right? It's supposed to be something that's so powerful metaphorically that it's basically true literally, okay? So again, when he's having this conversation, I can see that perspective because that is what I call like philosophy. What I say is like my exploration into my genre of philosophy is to say, do we actually know? And then what do we believe? And then if we think our perception is dictating what is reality, then we don't even know what we know. We only know what we've perceived to know, which means that even to know something, even to have a side, to even take a political stance is nothing. It means nothing. But then that confuses me because then Jordan, Jordan and all of us have to pick a bubble. We do have to pick a, a side. We have to pick a political stance. I mean, he certainly is passionate about his, but when we're talking about philosophy, there's something to this that I actually think is so much more interesting than people are willing to contend with. It would be so interesting if we could really admit, like, do we even know if it's real? And the question is, no, we cannot know we weren't there. Someone told me a story once. They told me they did a pretty bad thing. And I said, that's a horrible thing. You shouldn't have done that. And then somebody else told me, oh, do you know they did this bad thing? And they confirmed it. Now I had two people who told me this person did a bad thing, including the person who did the bad thing. Then I had a realization of, wait a second, I wasn't there. I don't know if they did the bad thing. I just know that I was told they did the bad thing. Having the person who did the bad thing tell you they did a bad thing or a good thing even or a neutral thing and then having someone witness it and say or or not witness it but say, oh, yes, I, I also, they did do it. I can confirm it still does not prove that they did it. I wasn't there. I didn't have the perception experience of knowing it to be true. I'm only believing and having faith that what they're telling me is true. Everything we have in life is basically a belief. It is rarely a knowing. And that's what's so hard to contend with because when Peterson says, I believe in X, now people are going to assume he knows X. And he's saying, I don't know X, I believe X. And so when people say, but if you believe X, that means you know X, which means you're now a part of our group. He goes, whoa, 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 wait. No, no, no. I believe X, which means I still don't know, but I live like I do. Which is why he says he lives like God is real. Not that he knows God is real. 
one of my friends hit me up and they were like, hey, do you think like once you heal, you never like have to heal again? And I was like, healing is a journey process. You have to continue the process. Healing is a process. Introspection is a process. It's all a process. And you don't stop the process because you discovered something true about the process. You now have a different relationship with the process because now you hold a different truth. You hold a different truth. So now you start again from the bottom. It's like your job. Think about getting promoted at your job. When you get promoted, you're starting again at a different level of the bottom and going up again. It's like when you look for a new challenge, you're starting at the bottom and going up again. That's what introspection should feel like. Introspection should feel like, oh, I reached the next level. Now I'm at the bottom again. You are a lifelong student. Doesn't mean you don't have to know yourself. It means you have to know yourself so much that you know you're going to discover new things about yourself. And therefore, knowing about life, it doesn't mean you don't know anything about life. It means you know so much about life, you know there's so much mystery to it. So why's my life a mess? Please tell me Cause I'm sick of thinking Yeah, I'm sick of reaching out for the truth And living life as a fool Then